Chambers' direct examination was quite rocky, and this was mainly because of ob objections that were made to it by the defense and were sustained by Judge Kaufman. Prosecutor Murphy wanted to go into Chambers' whole life as a communist, Chambers' version of Hiss's life as a communist, and Chambers' break with communism in great detail, and Judge Kaufman wouldn't allow it. A judge is allowed to exclude evidence, even if it's relevant, if the judge finds that what it proves, as we lawyers say, its probative value, is substantially outweighed by the danger that it will cause prejudice against a party. And Judge Kaufman said, calling somebody a communist in this day and age is very prejudicial, and I want to keep that to the minimum, lest it distract the jury from the real issue in this case. And the issue was very simple. It's in the indictment. Look at the indictment. Did, has, did his past chamber state department documents without authorization in 37 and 38? That's all. The indictment says nothing about the document passing being part of communism or a spy ring or the wear group or the dark night of the soul under communism. Hiss would be guilty if in 1938 he gave Chambers a draft of the new menu in the State Department cafeteria without authorization. Also, again, read the indictment. This is, a trial is not a general inquiry into what happened, especially a criminal trial. My job is to try this case. The first material act in this case occurs on January 2nd, 1937. And I'm keeping the trial within those limits. Now, in my opinion, this was a very narrow reading of the case, but a permissible one. Another problem, too, was Chambers' love of talking. He sort of tried to use the questions as a springboard to tell long and interesting stories um, about matters that the questions did not quite call for. For example, when Murphy asked him, to tell the jury what conversation occurred between him and Hiss when the two first met, uh, Chambers began his answer with, the meeting was for the purpose of introducing me to, and Judge Kaufman cut him off. The question was not what the purpose of the meeting was, Mr. Chambers, or what you thought the purpose of the meeting was. Who said what to whom? Who, said first? Who spoke first? What did he say? Who spoke next? What did he say? Later, when Murphy asked Chambers who said what at a certain meeting, Chambers said, I tried to set forth and the judge cut him off again, saying, don't tell us what you tried to do. Tell us what you said and what they said. And Judge Kaufman made a lot of rulings like this that limited Chambers' testimony. Chambers' fans consider this to be in favor of Hiss um, because they limited how much Chambers could tell about the whole story of all his dealings with Hiss and communists in general. I think the net effect may have been good for Chambers and the prosecution because when you let Chambers tell his story, any way he wants, when you give him free reign, after a while he starts to vibrate at strange frequencies and talking about the dark night of the soul under communism, and some people start to wonder whether he's totally trustworthy or maybe crazy. Perhaps precisely because Chambers was limited to just the facts, he did get, a, he unmistakably got across his basic story uh, without a doubt that Hiss regularly passed him State Department documents without authorization in 1937 and 38. Nobody in the jury had the slightest doubt that's what Chambers was saying by the end of his testimony. He also said that the last batches of documents he got from Hiss included the four notes in Hiss's handwriting, the 65 pages of type documents, and the 58 images on the two rolls of film that were developed when they came out of the pumpkin. Chambers' testimony was not very lively or memorably theatrical, but perhaps the very lack of those attributes made it more credible than it would have been if he'd been allowed to bring in the trombones and kettle drums. Then, of course, came Lloyd Paul Stryker's cross-examination of Chambers, and um, of which the following is an approximation of the most memorable part. Stryker said, the first question, Mr. Chambers, do you know what an oath is? And Chambers said, an oath is that declaration which a man makes when he promises to tell the truth. And Stryker said, and it is an affirmation made by a man who calls on Almighty God to witness the truth of what he says. Is that right? Chambers said, that's right. Stryker said, I show you a copy of a certain piece of paper, your application for employment by the federal government in October 1937. And I ask you if you recognize the signature on that paper. And Chambers said, yes. At the time you signed that paper, you were an active communist, an underhanded enemy of your country, doing all you could to help a foreign country overthrow our country by force and violence. Isn't that right? Chambers said, yes. In this paper, at the end, you took an oath, did you not? Chambers said, yes. 
Stryker said, I'm quoting from the paper. I, J. David Chambers, solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. You took and subscribed that oath, did you not? Chambers said yes. And it was false from beginning to end, was it not? And Chambers said, of course. And it was perjury, was it not? And Chambers said, if you like. And you told it to deceive and cheat the United States government into giving you a job that you well knew you were not entitled to. Isn't that true? And Chambers said, that's correct. And is it not a fact that during all the years you were a communist, you would with perfect readiness have committed perjury? Chambers said, that's correct. You would have cheated and defrauded the government. Chambers said, right. Stryker said, did your conscience bother you at all? Yes or no? Chambers said, no. At all that period when you were in the Communist Party, your conscience was dead. And Chambers said, my conscience was not dead. Stryker said, dormant. Chambers said, I had an entirely different point of view. I solved problems of right and wrong along communist lines. Stryker said, but then came the dawn. Then you repented and reformed and became a God-fearing Christian, an honest man. You did away with lying and stealing. You turned from the ways of treason, disloyalty, crime, and perjury. Let us look at your testimony before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. You denied to HUAC that you and Mr. Hiss had engaged in any espionage, and that was false testimony under oath, wasn't it? Chambers said yes. And you made the same false testimony to the grand jury in this building, didn't you? Under oath. Chambers said, that's right. Stryker said, after you'd taken an oath on the Bible in which you now believed, you gave false testimony? Yes. And after taking the same oath you took before this jury, Chambers said, that's right. Stryker said, and when you gave that false oath, this was after you had rejected atheistic communism and you'd become a Christian, wasn't it? Chambers said, that's true. Stryker said, so you gave false testimony before God. Of course. Did you revere the American flag? Chambers said, I did. And in the HUAC committee room, there was an American flag, was there not? Chambers said, there must have been. So when you swore falsely, you lied under oath before the American flag. Chambers said, of course. And this was at a time you had ceased to be a traitor and were trying to help the American government and paralyze the communist conspiracy, weren't you? Chambers said, yes. And you did not produce the papers and films that would have shown the existence of a spy ring in the state and treasury departments, did you? You withheld that information from your own land. Sworn to tell the truth, you suppressed such parts of the truth as you felt it expedient to suppress. And Chambers said, I felt I had a Christian duty. Did you feel you had a Christian duty to comply with the oath that you had registered in heaven? To tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And Chambers said, I felt that one outweighed the other. And so it went. Stryker took Chambers through every time he denied espionage by his or omitted specific mention of it when he talked to Burley and several times with the FBI, his early testimonies to HUAC and the grand jury. And for each of these lies, every time Stryker mentioned the Bible and the flag and you believed in God and you were a patriotic American, turning every lie into six lies. And the point, his, his only point was Chambers was a professional liar for 12 years and has lied 16 times under oath about the very events of this case. Does that not at least create a reasonable doubt that he's lying now? And Stryker's final question was, don't you recognize that your explanation for your silence these 10 years on grounds of your friendship with Mr. Hiss is another piece of perjury, is a sham and a fraud? And Chambers said, I do not. And thus ended three and a half days of cross-examination by Stryker. Um, Stryker seemed to be getting on in years, sort of, I think he was acting like the old trial lawyer taking one last case because I really believe in it. And he had to ask from time to time for a magnifying glass and to be corrected by his juniors about dates and numbers once in a while. Um, 
Please note the McCarthyite tone of the Hiss defense too. Communism's totally contemptible. Once a man is a communist, you can't believe a word he says. Another uh, perhaps interesting observation about Stryker's theatrics. Uh, the way things work in the Southern District of New York, if you're the witness on the stand, I'm a lawyer questioning you, I face you behind a lectern, the jury's over here, I'm not allowed to move. I am screwed into this place, and I'm not even supposed to look at the jury. This makes trials there extremely boring, by the way. Um, Stryker would uh, claim that he uh, couldn't quite hear Chambers and would sort of come out from behind the lectern and start to inch forward, and then when he got in front of the jury, he'd sort of turn to the jury and start making strange faces at them. And Murphy had to object, and the judge would tell him, get back behind the lectern. Um, once when Stryker was describing the walk to the pumpkin patch, he was making it out to be some sort of occult procession with torches and strange music. And he said, uh, you have rather a flair for the dramatic, have you not, Mr. Chambers? And Murphy jumped up and said, I think that can be well divided among the courtroom. And the judge told Ch Stryker to ask less argumentative questions. Now Chambers, for, the part, for his part, sat there like a sack of potatoes and just gave monosyllabic or tentative of course, it must have been answers, taking every one of Stryker's punches passively. His voice often trailed off at the end of a sentence so he couldn't be heard. Sometime he looked up at the ceiling. Um, he did not put on a dazzling performance. He didn't bite back at Stryker, but he didn't seem, he, he didn't crack and he didn't seem crazy either. Now in the second trial, and I'm going to jump ahead for that a bit, um, Hiss's lawyer bored in on Chambers' story in much more detail. He got Chambers to admit to considerable fuzziness and changes of memory about what color one of the Hiss's houses was, whether a certain party at the Hiss's was for Christmas or New Year's, whether he ever spent a night in the house the Hiss's lived in in 30th Street in Georgetown. And this is as good a time as any to mention, to show you the residences that the Hiss's had. Oh, rats, we got the wrong one. Sorry. My mistake. Can we start in the middle? I'd hate to have to go over them. Okay. The one, the, the Hisses Homes. I think. Yes? I think the line was this is as good a time as any. Yes, yeah. Okay. So what we'll do is, if you can make the notes again. Fine. We'll just okay, just great. Perfect, yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Yeah. Just, I'm going to take the one second, and we're still rolling when you're ready. Okay. This is as good a time as any to show the several residences that the Hisses had. All of them are in or near Georgetown. Um, the 28th Street apartment is the one that Hiss said he subleased to George Crosley. The P Street house is the one where Hiss said the Crosleys lived with Hiss, the Hisses for a few days. The 30th Street place, which is very small, is where the Hisses lived when, according to Chambers, they did the spying and Mrs. Hiss did most of the typing. And the Volta Place house is a rather large house that they moved into just before the end of 1937 and just before Chambers bugged out of the underground. I should add that this seems to me to be a lot of moves and that all these houses were rented. Well, as I said at the end, Chambers had gotten into the record his detailed testimony that Alger Hiss had passed him confidential State Department documents without authorization repeatedly in 37 and early 38. And the, chamber, the prosecution's next witness was Mrs. Chambers. She claimed to know nothing of her husband's secret communist activities. I wonder if she was really that ignorant. Uh, she did, however, corroborate in great detail uh, her husband's story of a close relationship between her family and the Hisses lasting several years. She said that she'd met Alger Hiss several times when the two couples socialized together at one or another of their houses. They went to the movies together in Baltimore. More, more particularly, Mrs. Chambers testified that Mrs. Hiss had come up to Baltimore or she, Mrs. Chambers, had come down to Washington on several occasions, and the two had gone, lunch, had gone shopping and had lunch and perambulated their babies together. 
The two couples, she said, had visited places you'd go with a friend in Baltimore and Washington, such as Haynes Point, Mount Vernon, Hutzler's department store in, in uh, Baltimore. The Hisses even drove the chamber's furniture from Washington to New York, and quite a favor if it happened. Perhaps most memorably, Mrs. Chambers remembered being over at the Hisses' 30th Street house, and this is after the Hisses said we kicked them out of our lives, when Mrs. Chambers' baby wet the floor and Mrs. Hiss gave her a lovely old linen towel to use as a diaper. Uh, Mrs. Chambers also remembered painting a portrait of the Hiss's stepson and the Hisses hanging it in their home. And both Chambers has described long stays with the Hisses at a few places in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Um, Whitaker Chambers testified that on one of those trips, the family was returning south on Easter Sunday, and in Norristown, Pennsylvania, they stopped at an intersection, and past them walked a policeman carrying an Easter lily, which greatly pleased Alger Hiss, Chambers said. Mrs. Hiss rem uh, Mrs. Chambers remembered Mrs. Hiss taking a nursing course in 1937. So she knew about something Mrs. Hiss had done, if it's true, two years after, according to the Hisses, we got the Chamberses out of our lives. That Mrs. Hiss had taken a course in 1937 in inorganic chemistry was later proved from the records of the University of Maryland. Mrs. Chambers also remembered she and Whitaker Chambers being with the Hisses on several occasions in 1937, thus being perhaps a second witness to count two in the indictment. Well, when Lloyd Paul Stryker cross-examined Mrs. Chambers, he went at her hammer and tongs just as he had with her husband, not treating her as the fair sex, and she barked and bit back. Uh, Stryker kept referring to uh, your husband, the underground communist, your husband, that criminal, the deceiver, your husband, the secret enemy of the United States, and your husband, that liar who represented himself to the world as a decent citizen. And finally, she couldn't take it anymore, and she burst out, I resent that. My husband is a decent citizen, a great man. And Stryker said, was he a decent citizen in October 1937? And she said, when uh, he was in the, the underground? I just asked a simple question. Was he a great and decent citizen in October 1937? Yes or no? And Mrs. Chambers shouted back, yes, and always. And Stryker said, so the jury will understand your conception. Is it your idea that a man who was plotting and conspiring by any all means to overthrow the government of his country, who'd been sneaking around for 12 years under false names, that is your conception of a great, decent citizen? Is that right? And she said, no, but if he believed that is the right thing to do at the moment, I believe that is a great man who lives up to his beliefs. His beliefs may change, as they did. Now, on cross-examination, Mrs. Chambers proved even fuzzier than her husband on some dates and places. For example, she initially remembered a New Year's Eve in, the Hisses, in 1937 and 1938 in the Hisses Volta Place house, where the Hisses said the Chamberses had never been. And on cross-examination, she got very confused about whether it was a New Year's Eve party or a housewarming party. They moved in in December 29, 1937 or was a celebration of the Hisses' wedding anniversary. Well, it can't have been about the wedding anniversary of the Hisses, because that was on December 11, and they didn't move into Volta Place until December 29. And she hemmed and hawed under Lloyd Paul Stryker's contemptuous cross-examination for hours, but she was absolutely certain that she and her husband had been guests in the Volta Place house in 37. Um, at the second trial, uh, Mrs. Uh, his, his, his lawyer chided her for remembering things for the first time, and she said, yes, that is a new recollection. Yes, I'll probably keep on recollecting for the rest of my life, perhaps too late for this trial. At another point in the second trial, Mrs. Chambers was describing she and her husband hiding out in Florida just after sh they'd fled the communist underground, and for the first time, she testified that when she slept in those days, she had a hatchet under their pillow in case she was attacked by communists. And Hiss's lawyer chided her for not having mentioned the hatchet at the first trial. Did you purposely leave out the reference to sleeping with the hatchet under your pillow? And Mrs. Chambers shot back, I was not asked that question, sir. It's no great pleasure to remember it. My general impression of Mrs. Chambers that she was far from a perfect witness when it came to memories of dates and places, but she was trying to remember what happened. 
and maybe she got some sympathy with, from the jury for barking back at Hiss's lawyers. Um, she does not seem to be rehearsed or forgetting her lines or making it up as she goes along, or at least that's uh, my opinion. Next, the documents. What's in all those spy papers? 